Hi, I'm Lauren Passarelli, and this is Coffee Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Furlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department at Berklee College of Music, and welcome to another Coffee Talk. As usual, we're here with Cheryl Bailey, assistant chair. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, how are you? And I have uh, assistant to the assistant chair, Joni. Joni the cat, if you're unable to see, is really enjoying today, one of our remote days. So she's pretty thrilled. Uh, we've got Ian Steed, our senior coordinator. Hey, Ian. Hey, all. How's it going? And our guest today is Professor Lauren Passarelli, who's been in the guitar department for a very long time. Thank you, Lauren, for being here. Sure. Good to see you. So, Lauren, I saw that you uh, you have a mug there, and the yes. first question we always ask everybody is, um, "What's in it? What's in it? Yeah, that's right. Water. 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 <laughs> Lauren, I did bring it home. I brought it home specifically for the taping because it's usually at school. So, Lauren, are you a hydrator? Like, are you a deep believer in hydration? Do you drink coffee? Like, what's your I never actually acquired a taste for coffee, unfortunately, and I'm such a hyper puppy that I don't need the caffeine. So I save my caffeine for chocolate. <laughs> nice. But one time a friend took me to a place where you could actually make mugs. So I wanted to show you the two mugs I made. <laughs> they're a little funny and they're certainly one of a kind. And then, of course, this one was a bit of a signature model. Got to put a little guitar on there. That's really cool. There's a guitar on there and there's your name. That's really, that's hip. I like that. That's that really fun. cool. I mean, you know, I think it's good that Always you have to cool things to drink your water out of. That's pretty yeah. great. Yeah. I like uh, herbal teas. Herbal teas happen a lot and um, kombucha. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I like that you know your energy level. I think that's oh. really important. And, uh, you know, that comes across a lot when we open these conversations with them. Um... Yeah. Well, it's like your doshas, right? The Ayurvedic teaching. Mm -hmm. There's the Vada, the Pitta, and the uh, Kapha. And mm -hmm. I'm like total Vada, which is like, you know, so. <laughs> like the air, like you're going, you're moving. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, Lauren, one of the other things that people want to know right off the bat um, is about first days at Berkeley. <laughs> and obviously you went to Berkeley and then you taught at Berkeley. So you've had different first days, but yeah. are there things that stand out to you about either of them or, um, you know, other multiple firsts that you had? You, you, what memories come back to you? Well, I first found out about Berkeley when I was 11. Hmm. My teacher had me use an Alfred's book, a, a Mel Bay, and then we went straight to a modern method for guitar. and. I said, this is pretty hard for a level one book. And he said, you're 11, this is a college textbook. I said, there's a college where you can go for guitar? I'm going. <laughs> and what did I know about college? You know, all I knew is like, I love guitar and I've just got to go where they appreciate guitar. And so it was always Berkeley. So when I was 14, I wrote to the college and said, look, I know 20 places to play the C major seven chord. I've been through both modern method books. What can I do next? I want to make sure I'm ready. And they, uh, Robert Scher wrote me back and he said, oh, you're ready. You just fill out the application. Come now. I said, I'm only 14. I'll see you in four years. So I wrote him back. It was really funny. But the very first uh, experience then coming as a student was so beautiful because there was only two buildings, you know, so it was just like finally you get to go to a place where you could eat, sleep, drink music 24 hours a day. And it was just the 1140 building and the 150 building. There might have been the Hemingway dorm, but I've never seen it. I've never been there. And what I just loved was that you're hanging out in an old hotel, you know, because I never liked grammar school or high school. You know, to me, it was like, just give me music. And uh, Berkeley was like the best place in the world to be. I would have gone anywhere in the world, wherever Berkeley was. This was the place. That's so cool. I think there's so many people who share that. Um... Yeah. The teacher that the teacher you wrote to when you were fourteen was was he still at Berkeley when when you got there? No, I wrote to the college and Robert <laughs> Scher wrote me back. He was the okay. dean at the time. Oh no, kidding! Was he still there when you when you showed up? I think so. I don't know if I've ever met him, but yeah, I think he was that there. Really cool. That's very cool that he wrote you back and that you were yeah. like, okay, this is 
I like that you identified, like, I just want you to know that I'm coming. <laughs> I think that's great. It would be so awesome to find that letter somewhere, somewhere in a box somewhere in 1140. We're going to find that letter. Like we found Tronzo's proficiency test. We're going to find oh, that yeah. LP yeah. letter. Mark French said he had all of our proficiencies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because we were doing like just some moving of stuff. Like I think yeah. it was like they were going to re-carpet or something. So we went in there. <laughs> And Jack had retired, and so Jack Pezzanelli, and so we were like, okay, we're going to move stuff. And we did. We found people's test scores and attendance sheets. Like, we were calling people like, hey, you know, in 1976, you didn't come to week 12. What were you doing? You know? <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's really, really cool that when you were 11, you knew that this, not just that you wanted to do guitar, but you, had, you found a place, and then now that you've been here, you really a lot of your life has been oh yeah <laughs> Berkeley you know yeah I've been here in Massachusetts because of Berkeley since 1978 so yeah and, it's a long time and then Lauren well, oh go ahead well it's just so different now because you know in those days guitar we were like roaches there were so many guitar players that d different departments didn't know what to do with us so especially the ensemble department they would just stick three or four guitar players in every ensemble because we just had too many and uh i don't know if you guys knew about it but they had these things somebody was making them they're about three feet off the ground they were these called uh oliver amps and it had a switch tape or amp it had four quarter inch inputs in the front and like one eight inch speaker and in the top was a flip top with a little cassette deck in it and so three guitar players and a bass player would get plugged into this thing. And in those days, the ensemble department gave you, the teacher that you had gave you your rating. So the idea was, if you can play and you can show me you can play, you can get out of this class. And I was like, you gotta be kidding. You know, like these guys are playing at a time, they're playing at a tune, you know, this is worse than my garage band bands when I was in grammar school. It's like, I told the teacher, look, I will play with the bass player and drummer by myself so that you can see that I can play and get me out of this class, you know? So there are a lot of classes where if you didn't test high, you know, you had to find your own way. And you just, I just made my way to all my other teachers and tested out of reading one, chord lab one, all these places, because it was so easily to be underestimated. Mm. You know, they just don't expect much when, uh, you know, you just see a new little kid walk into school, you know? But when I first started teaching, I had students that had degrees in other subjects. You know, it was amazing to see that you can't underestimate people. They, they will surprise you. You know, they, they know a lot more than you think they do. That's really cool. I, I mean, my question that came to mind is somewhat related to that in the sense that when you came to teach at Berkeley, you were on the cusp of the stylistic development of the department. You were bringing music that wasn't jazz really into the forefront of our curriculum you were one of the very first people to do that and and, and to be hired specifically to do that like, yeah we had like? mostly jazz and classical like the scenery recitals that we had to do uh was either 45 minutes jazz or 45 minutes classical and the other 15 was the opposite and you had to do a half hour solo and um i couldn't do any original tunes i wasn't allowed to sing i wasn't even allowed to talk it was like, this is a senior recital. This is serious. And we've had many men throwing up beforehand and not being able to finish their senior recital. You're not going to be able to finish. I was like, I'll finish. I've done a lot of solo shows on my own. I'm okay, you know. And it was nice to, uh, it, like, I felt amazing after that senior recital because I was in my apartment after the show, senior recital, and I was thinking, oh, my God it's like I'm supersonic, you know, it's like I've become a superhero guitar player, like my hands will do anything I ask them to, my ears will hear anything I want. It's like I finally had the freedom. I had so much information from Berkeley that I could do anything. I could completely express myself. It was just amazing. I was so excited to finally you know, finish. That, I, there's a couple things I want to point out there. One is that when you talk about playing classical music, you're playing classical music on your electric guitar with a pick. Yeah, it's if you were so, going to be a, a jazz player, you had to get the right hand technique. Right. And so like the incredible demand of doing that with the <laughs> repertoire really hones your technique. And I think that's one of the things you're saying, like there was a prescription in terms of like what you had to do. 
But baked into that was this idea that because you have to do that, when you come out of it, you'll have built this foundation almost by default, right? That you, you've had to put the time in. And if people want to hear and see what that looks like, there's a recording of you <laughs> that we have put on YouTube yeah. of you playing Recuerdos, which is like yeah. a stock, like a absolute foundational piece in the classical guitar repertoire that people yeah. play in tremolo. And if you're listening on the audio, you're not seeing me, but I'm making the tremolo um, motion with my hand which is like where you play three notes really rapidly on the top strings and you play a bass line and it gives the illusion that it's this constant like 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 water right with a bass line wow. coming and lauren plays this with a pick <laughs> and you cannot believe it I, I mean i've watched this video so many times because i'm just watching you to see how you could possibly be that relaxed I know, they, you know, it was seven minutes long, you know, it was a long oh, time ago. Really long. And, and you take the repeats and like, you know, the classical faculty and I are like, she's taking the repeats, you know, like, oh my God. <laughs> so I think that maybe we can have been feature that one again, but it's on our YouTube. <laughs> if you look up yeah. in the faculty concert playlist, there's, there, there's you doing that. So I, I think that's, that really is, is quite incredible. And um, if you get to study with Lauren, you can ask her how she did that book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think like there's so many ways we can go, right? But because I do want to come back to kind of how you work on stuff like that with your students and work on breathing and tone production and technical facility. Um, but I don't want to leave this topic of like this idea that what it was like for you as a faculty member to start to bring a curriculum for styles of music that weren't jazz or classical well, music. Besides classical, they had, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, that's right. They, they had uh, a couple of folks doing rock and some funk and some blues, okay. you know, but they didn't have anybody writing songs. And um, I've been writing songs since 1970. So I just love that, you know, just taking that small little riff or something and turning it into a finished song is just so exciting to me, especially when it becomes a finished recording. So I've always loved that. I've been playing with, you know, those kinds of recording toys since I was a little kid. And it's really interesting. I tell my students this all the time. Whatever you are being made fun of <laughs> while you're young and that you're kind of a, a, a geek about it, those are going to be your things that are your strengths and that you'll get paid the most money for when you're older. So, you know, the things that you love and you're crazy about, they're not bad, even if nobody else is into them. But of course, at Berkeley, we have a lot of folks that are interested in these, these things. You finally find your home when you come to Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's really interesting because you created that you found your home as a faculty member and have created that for other students. I'm looking behind you and um, you're in your studio. Yeah. And so I think what you've done is you've designed this really nice bridge to production and engineering and writing and composition mm -hmm. that maybe wasn't in the guitar department in a deep way before that. Um, yeah. And well, I being, think that's cool. Thank you. Uh, being such a, a, a beetle at heart, um, you know, it's always been one of the most popular things to sing and play the guitar, but it doesn't mean it has to be wimpy guitar. It could be really interesting uh, composite rhythms and playing crazy things at the same time and singing things. I like making that connection in the brain and um, making that composite rhythm by singing and playing something slowly and then building it up so that it's this, this wild thing. It feels interesting in your brain to do it, you know. It just feels mm -hmm. exciting to work on something and get a glimpse of that you can actually get that to happen. I think what's really cool about that is it's almost like, you know, we're trying to get students to practice that way. Like in the, in all the things that you've mentioned is, is like you, you want people to go deep into learning their fretboard, learning how to use their hands, use learning their tone, learning about form and application of all these musical ideas and, and like find an organized way to practice it and a strategic mm -hmm. way to put things together in their practicing. So obviously you were doing that for yourself. But then when you, you've also done it on a curricular level, like you've had to step back and say like, okay, this is how I practice, but now I'm going to write a class. So a lot mm. of the classes that you've written didn't exist before. Like you wrote the Beatles labs in the guitar department. You also wrote ensembles that are in the ensemble department. There was one that had 
a cross course with when we were able to get in the studios with the studio part. So it's like breaking down all the, the ways things are recorded. Right. Then you've done labs for songwriters, like to develop their own music, you know, you've, and then you taught like all of the core stuff too, when we had reading labs and we, and you know, mm. you're finding your way to make the proficiency work for people. So did you, I mean, st stepping back, I think what I'm trying to say is I'm making connections from the way you talk about practicing to the way you're building systems of practicing basically for others. Did you find that connection? Like, or was it creative work for you to build classes or how did that work for you? I wanted to teach things that I was uh, passionate about, you know, and I was meeting so many private students that were interested in songwriting that, um, you know, most of the uh, time, the guitarists have a lack of guitar knowledge. So then their songs all sound the same or they have very few chord choices. And so to give them more fluency on the instrument gives them better tools to express themselves. So it just seemed cool to say, let's do it in a class as well. Yeah. Um, Ian, I know that before we started this, you, you had some things on your mind that you're kind of dying to get Lauren to talk about again. Do you have one of those? Yeah. Yeah. Lauren. Okay. So you had an interesting, uh, a little tidbit of, um, insight one time that you shared with me pretty recently, which was you, um, hit me to a quote and I'm not sure where this came from, but you said, um, we were talking about like practicing from the right space and performing mm. in a way where you really were prepared, not just musically, but also in other parts of your being, right? Being in shape or being relaxed. Um, and you, you said this quote, you said, um, if you want to paint the perfect painting, make yourself perfect and then just paint paint right? naturally yeah and i heard that naturally yeah i heard that quote sometime when i was in college and i was just so pissed off about it for years i was like what the heck does that mean you know it really bothered me and then i realized with uh you know getting older and stuff that it's like the more you feel like yourself the more that you can actually freely give of yourself and just be in love with the fact that you love this instrument or you love this song or you just love music, that just can center you so deeply because it's not about how am I doing or what does this audience think? It's what you think. It's what you love about the music. It's what you're bringing to it. So if it's like you have a choice out in the audience to like or dislike whatever they're listening to, me, you know, but when I'm playing, I'm just having the greatest time and I'm wanting to, to share that. So to me, it's like bring your best self to it. Be you know, relaxed, be calm, um, find the way that you feel your strongest, whatever that is, you know, try to tune yourself the way we tune in guitar, you know, tune yourself to be your best self and then paint, <laughs> play. And that like is also just tied to like specific things. Like when you say tuning yourself, like that really could mean like your posture, your tension in your back or you know yeah. holding tension in your jaw you know something that yeah. guitar players i see sometimes you know, like making a face when they're playing like kind of stressed and it's like you know like really being relaxed in a way <laughs> to where you're playing from a space that you're talking about like where you're really tuned and you're also aware like tuning could also be mental right like what's oh, your mental definitely. space <laughs> when you perform do you have yeah. all this mind chatter what's it saying like are you in the right zone to just really be in the moment and focus on the music, right? Well, yeah, that zone is available all the time. And so sometimes people talk about writer's block or player's block or all these things. But right now we don't have eater's block. We're not having sleeping block, right? We're choosing to be here to do something else. So you can choose to do your thing. And like uh, this book I was reading recently, uh, Steve Chandler says, um, outdo the, the, the problem, right? So if you feel like you can't play or you can't think or you can't just overpower it, do tons of thinking, do tons of playing. And that feeling of I can't play goes away. You overwhelm it with that. But like music exists on more levels than just intellectually. And Berkeley can only teach the intellectual part. You know, we're teaching the nuts and bolts and the actual facts. 
And so sometimes students get upset. They're like, it's like going to Hogwarts and I'm finding out how all the tricks work and now it doesn't feel like magic anymore. It's like, it is magic. What it makes it magic is you. You need to put your heart and soul back into it. And these symbols that be, look like notes and various chord names and things, they become music again when you put yourself into it. It's, it doesn't exist on its own, really. That's really a cool perspective to that. And I think that's a topic that comes up over and over again. It's like a theme of these conversations <laughs> that, you know, there's musical problems and there's non-musical problems. Mm. And I love what you said when you're talking about your recital and you said like, I had all of the stuff in my hands and in, on my fretboard, like all this music. And I felt like I was so free. And that's like, you know, your musical foundation. And now you're really talking with people about like knowing yourself. And yeah. I think sometimes that's harder, especially when you're younger. That, that idea that, you know, get, trying to get to know yourself over time mm. is, is, is kind of, can kind of feel like a daunting task because it, on the surface seems like, oh yeah, I'm gonna express what I wanna express. But then you have to get into <laughs> you know, what makes things hard for you or what are your own blocks or what are your own challenges. And mm. um, definitely you're the type of teacher, I mean, when you say Berkeley can't teach that, a lot of students do come to you with some, I mean, Just I know that you yeah, I know that you're the type of teacher that does sit with people to work that out as much as another person can. And do you yeah. feel like that's a part of your work as a, faculty member? Well, definitely, because I feel like, you know, if their head isn't in the right place, they're not going to do what I'm telling them to do anyway. <laughs> they're not going to practice, you know, but if we can understand it or find what they're interested in, you know, to me, I'm always trying to figure out well, what are you going to do with all this stuff? We all have the same notes. We all have the same chords available to us. What are you trying to express with this? Where are you going? Where are you now? And how can I help you get there? You know, they don't usually, um, think that way but I mean you can even do that with a piece like we were saying Recuerdos all these pieces if you pick the right kind of repertoire will bring your playing up to a new level it will give you a new style it'll give you a new technique and very often people don't pick pieces especially for their uh, performance piece for their proficiency I loved when they used to say it's great to play a piece your first and second semester that's a chord solo a chord melody or a, a classical piece because Guitar players aren't used to playing chords and melody at the same time. And we're one of very few instruments that can do that. You know, most of them play one note. And I find it very disappointing the last 30 years or so where rhythm guitar isn't being used in music and people are playing guitar like it's a flute. You know, it's like it's a monophonic instrument. They don't even know a chord exists or they can't play, you know, they only play one note or play only or only play six. Like they don't know there's all these things in between. There's all this beautiful counterpoint and amazing lines and compositional techniques you can get into with guitar it's just fabulous and i'm always trying to say well let's you know have you heard of this have you heard this kind of player there's so much to to appreciate with guitar it's, it's just so uh expressive and, and uh, so much richer than they know you know yeah and and like sort of the like the inverse of what you just said about like you know <laughs> here's the material like what are you going to do with it there's also yeah. the inverse of like like what can you do here's material to do things with right like these things that we learn as musicians yeah. like that seem like just technical things like it's actually like this whole palette of things that you can use right and right. That, like it's a way of getting out of you know some of the habits or you know, devices that you already are familiar with. Yeah, and it really depends on what your frame of reference is, right? What you grew up listening to or what you're exposed to or what you think the guitar does. If you're only listening to one or two things, that's all you think the guitar does. But when I was nine, my guitar teacher, Lou Sabini, gave me Howard Roberts albums and Barney Kessel and uh, Charlie Christian and Johnny Smith. And he said, take these home. This is great guitar playing. And it just blew my mind. It was so gorgeous. And I was playing Moonlight in Vermont for my, uh, you know, high school. You know, it was like, I just love these chords. How could you not want to play chords? They're gorgeous. You know, they just give you so many goosebumps. And it's about that. You know, it's about making that music magic. You know, how do you get that that feeling again? How do you get those goosebumps? If you're getting inspired to want to play that instrument, 
figure out what you can write or share that brings other people that 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 feeling you know it's just so exciting <laughs> i i like what you're both saying about you know things that when you make music into education you you make requirements you know so we have the proficiency the final exam material and right. And I think a lot of people are tricked somehow because it's in school. They think, oh, it's just a requirement. It's just the, but it's not like someone wrote it and said, maybe you'll use it someday. It's like, no, people who were using this stuff in the world came back and said, you know, I really wish that this had been all collected in one spot, all these amazing tools that I will yeah. use over and over again for the rest of my life. I'm going to do that for the next generation of students and the one after that i'm going to put it all in one place so that everybody can internalize it and work on it so it's not like the chicken and the egg thing i, I said to a student the other day it's it's not like this is the egg and it might become a chicken this is like the chicken <laughs> had a gig and then came back and like said this is what you're gonna do it's like this is really the tool that you're using so it's not just like a bunch of cursory stuff and then something might come of it you're mm -hmm. really using these things, the way you're describing them, it doesn't sound like drudgery practice. You know, it sounds like everything that's so exciting and thrilling about what we do, because it's all the stuff you need to do what you what you really dream to do. It's what real music is, you know, it's like, it's not any different out there, you know, Bonnie Raitt and uh, Phil Collins both said to me, I wish I could have come to a college like Berkeley, you know, so you're either going to get it handed to you in four years in a beautiful systematic way like Berkeley, or you're gonna have to figure it out for yourself on the road for the next 40 years. And that's what a lot of people do. And it's hit or miss, you know, like they have a lot of holes in their understanding. But you know, I wanted to ask you guys, because it's a completely different kind of a, a thing. I feel like rock and roll is just too young to have any kind of pedagogy about it. And the only way to get different personality and flavors into the melodies is to like step into the shoes of like at least 14 different guitar players, because I like being able to make something sound like James Taylor or George Harrison or Jeff Beck or Pat Metheny, or it goes on and on and on, Johnny Smith. You know, it's like these kinds of influences on how you speak, how you play is so interesting because I had a situation where I invited Sandra Cott, a violin teacher at Berkeley to come to my house and do some violin work for me many, many years ago. And I wrote down a little melody and I didn't dare put in the bowing, even though I took schooling for strings. So they thought she plays with the symphony. Let her figure out what she wants to do. Right. So she said, well, how would you like me to play this? And she played it 14 different ways and they had 14 different emotions and feelings about them. And my jaw was like on the floor because I thought if I put these few measures in front of any guitar player, they go ding, 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 ding. And that's your melody. There's your rhythm. That's what you've got. And it's not. You can put any kind of an emotion into it. And so it really is upsetting to hear so many people like they're like strangling an alligator all the time, you know, like they're, it's like they got to kill this thing. It's a beast. It's a beast, you know, and they're being electrocuted or, or they're, they're playing as if uh, uh, it, it's like a, a seizure. They're having a seizure, you know, it's like there are other ways. You don't have to always be at this fever pitch. You know, there's so many emotions in between. Like if we said, I always use this example in my classes. If we said, say the line, close the door. You could say it infinite amount of ways. If you were in a film and your your line was close the door, how would you say it? It's like, well, what's happening? Who's in the scene? Am I there by myself? Is there somebody else? Am I mad? Am I angry? Am I being sexy? Am I being, you know, like coy? What's happening? You know, you could say it in so many different ways, so many different volumes, so many different textures, so much energy. And like guitar players aren't taught anything about phrasing or articulation. So the only way to get them to say, make it sound like this and make it sound like that, that teaches them how to play quietly, how to play beautifully, how to do some sustain, how to do some staccato. What do you guys think about that? Well, I'm going to answer for me and then I'm going to kick it over to Cheryl. Cause I, Cause wanna... I think classical, yeah. Classical players, thinking, anyway. classical players, players, horn players, they know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, we talk, we work so much on the connections between technique and tone production. It is a part of everything we play. It, it's completely embedded. That's amazing. Um, and what I've noticed is the studio electric guitar players really understand this. And um, when I started playing with um, with David Tronzo, he was a studio guy for a long time. And so mm -hmm. he had a very similar way of talking about it than the as the classical people did. Like, 
oh, he cool. calls it the parameters of sound. So you really are taking apart like the shape of the note, like the envelope of the note and how mm -hmm. you deal with your attack, sustain, decay, release, which is like what we would talk about, but also like then how timbre works into that. So like all your muting, all your, um, we don't really bend, but like hammer-ons, pull-offs, um, that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, and really listening to the ends of the notes, like Berta Rojas came over last night, was playing for me some stuff she's going to play in comp premiere. And like, I'm basically like looking at the scores and telling her about the ends of the notes and how the dynamics could be embedded. And I'm like, well, you know that you don't have to be so heavy with that because it could be lighter. And so we're basically talking about dynamics, timbre, an envelope all the time and phrasing all the time, just constantly talking about it and how it lives in your body when you breathe, when you, you have to, because it's, there's a physicality about that style and there's a, um, the value system of how the tone production is valued in the, in the performance makes wow. that absolutely necessary. And I think mm -hmm. for studio musicians, when they say something like that, like we need this to sound like this right now. So they've had a, the, to kind of maybe re, because you're saying it's newer in terms of pedagogy, they had to reverse engineer that. Hmm. Like, how do I get this sound? And it's the same because it's the same hands that we have, right? Yeah. So it, it, there's leverage and there's, you know, um, and there's things to think about. And I know a lot of jazz musicians think about it too, but I think you're right. Like there's not a universal guitar pedagogy for it that people necessarily come to berkeley for so i want to say that from my perspective it's a berkeley value oh good but i i mean i think it's an absolute value in our embedded in everybody's pedagogy but i think the difference for classical musicians is that i know that by the time someone gets to college they've already had like all of their teachers are focused on that yeah and none. that's not the case none, none for, for our them. students <laughs> if they're not classical <laughs> they haven't heard anything about like that it. What do you think about that, Cheryl, in terms of the jazz teaching that you've seen and, and that, you know, that what do you have to focus on here? Or do you see that pre-college? Well, I don't associate it with genre. And I actually am thinking about Lauren and, and our, you know, when we've talked about how you grew up in Jersey and your teachers and the music that you were around, listening to all that different music, I think, that, you know, makes you aware of that no matter what style i mean you you have i think players have your uh i don't know a direction that you know you love maybe you know i'm a rock or i love to play blues or this and that but almost all the really great guitarists are great musicians right you're open you know i i mean i maybe people consider me a jazz guitarist but i listen to classical piano and i listen to bluegrass music and I listen because I just you know so I think and what what Lauren's saying like growing up you you had all these different approaches to the guitar and you and you actually weren't pigeonholing them you're going this is just playing the guitar beautifully yeah and I, didn't, and I think I that's know. what I, you do with your students like when I when I meet your students you know you know especially like in doing proficiency and stuff they're always really spot on and really prepared and that's because you instill in them that it's a, a I don't know if it's a, we could call it a worth work ethic or just that just love and respect for playing the guitar yeah uh -huh. you know beautifully <laughs> I, I want them to love it I want them to I want them to connect you know I want to connect with them I want to make it real you know Berkeley's motto is to be rather than to seem and it's not like just the cool haircut or you got the latest cool guitar or the greatest effect. It's like, can you really play this thing? This is important, you know, because that's why you're here. You're spending a fortune to just look cool with your sunglasses. That's not going to cut it. You know, it's like you've got to really be able to play. And OK, maybe Berkeley isn't for everybody, but you've got to figure that out. Like you were saying, Cheryl, it comes down to two, two uh, choices, you know. You either dive in and get your money's worth and be a sponge and soak it up, you know, get everything you possibly can out of the place, or you figure it out on your own, you know, you don't go. I, I think too, um, you know, what you're just saying about playing, the, you know, I guess we were talking about in terms of like songwriting mm -hmm. and, you know, you have students come in and you can see that it's you know, like a diamond in the rough, mm -hmm. but they might not, they don't have the skills and what you're, what you do is you get them 
as you become a better guitarist and you understand music deeper, your ears open, that opens up the possibilities of, you know, yeah. if you just know a couple of root position chords, granted, you can write some great music like that. There's some great music that's just that. But, you know, like, you know, you're so, um, I've dug into the Beatles, like to me, this voice leading. You need, so you learn about voice leading, all of a sudden, three chords sounds like a classical piece of music. Oh, because the you're using the inversions or you're using that walking line of the seventh mm -hmm. moving down to the fifth or whatever. But that takes a little skill in finding that on your instrument and mm -hmm. exploring what that concept is. And then you're going to become a really great songwriter. Well, you really learn about counterpoint and uh, melody and beautiful chords listening to the Beatles. If you Google what chords they used, they're all the chords we teach. They were playing thousands and thousands of standards from their parents' generation, just wanting to get gigs and be entertainers. They weren't trying to be rock stars. And uh, they experienced the chords. They heard the songs, they liked them, they liked the way they were put together, the form, the progressions, and then they experienced them because they played them. You know, so, you know, you just watch the first Ed Sullivan show and there's George playing all these gigantic arpeggios, all these beautiful lines on the cover of Till There Was You, you know, like they really could play. You know and what they, also that made me think, sorry to say that, but just thinking about, you know, thinking about you coming up and like Sal DeFusco said, very similar thing, just about learning tunes, these tunes, they're just songs. Mm -hmm. And that that influence, like the more songs that you know and you understand about a great song. Yeah, there we you know whatever these songs that we grow up with, they're either folk songs or they're whatever you want to call them standards. Mm. They're great songs, and and that you absorb all that, and that's what you're saying. Like you know, those guys did the same thing. <laughs> they absorbed it, you know, by osmosis. I like what both of you are saying that it it really comes down to really taking care of the music. And that's something that Cecil said yesterday when we were hanging out with him. Ian and I had a conversation with him. And um, I think when you approach it that way, when you listen with care and you get really excited and then you think about how am I going to translate that sound that I'm hearing here? Or like what you're saying about the chords, you play these chords and they sound beautiful. And then what are you going to do with them? I think all of those things really help you work on your, song, your tone and your phrasing and your sound. Yeah. I mean in a way like what we have in classical music is this like like this technical pedagogy that helps you not get hurt while you're sort of going through these steps but the truth is is that all great guitar players go through the steps like cheryl was saying hmm. because you have to be able to sound great <laughs> and the real window in there um is that you have to be able to care about how you sound and then sort of start to think about how that what that means for your hands and what that means for your mm -hmm. mind and your ear and and um you know even if you did go through the a classical style pedagogy if you didn't care about your sound it would just sound hollow you know it wouldn't sound like anything because you have to bring yourself to it and you have to care about what you're doing and and sometimes i think that it's good for our students to hear this because sometimes they get overwhelmed by all the new material. Mm. And it's easy to forget that like, hey, these are really useful, beautiful tools that you're going to use in the way you want to use them. Well, well it's your sense of touch, right? You know, it's like the sound happens here. Right. If it's good here, then if you amplify it or put on effects, it's going to be all right. Um, when I think it's still on YouTube too. When Pat Metheny came to visit the school one of the first times and meet the faculty, he had no intention of playing for us. Mm -hmm. And I said, you've got to play. The students have to hear that you yourself sound good. It's not the big production. It's not the arrangement. It's not the, the mix. It's not the effects. It's not the sound, whatever on stage. It's you. You coming out of those speakers sounds great. You just touching your guitar sounds great. And he did. He then played for us. And, and you know, he was concerned because he said his chops were down. But he still sounded better than almost any guitar player on the planet, you know. And he was, you know, doing all these wild things. He was always saying, I, I should study alternating picking. You know, and it's like, well, you, you should, you know. <laughs> It'll make your life a lot easier. Uh, but what made me laugh about the chords before was when I first came to Berkeley, my favorite kind of chord was a major seven. And when I graduated, it was a minor nine. <laughs> so I always laugh and say, Berkeley didn't change me that much. <laughs> That's great. That's great. 
because because they, students are worried about that. You know, they they think uh, Berkeley's going to change them, you know, and make them forget what they already know. And it's like, no, they want to enhance everything you already know. They want to give you more tools to be more, you know, and do more. And uh, they, I think the disconnect is they want to come to a place like Berkeley to become great, but they don't realize this is what you really have to do to get there. They're shocked by that. The growth. There's a growth realization and also <laughs> that you have to um you're going to keep growing you know that yeah. we're all still learning no matter how yes. long we've done this and this is this is just setting a good foundation for the rest of your life of learning about this instrument and yourself mm -hmm. on the instrument like yeah. i mean i i hope my reaction when you said that was like i hope you change in four years of having this experience where you're with people from all over the world and you're in this like environment that's so intense musically that's designed to help you achieve what you the next phase of what you want to do I, I hope it changes you in a good way it yeah. supports you and like i felt like my music was here and all the berkeley stuff i had to do was out there and then when i finished my senior recital i realized all of that fueled me you know it felt, felt like it made me a superhero musician and i always wanted that i always just wanted to be a great guitar player and it's just it's such a fast track to do it you know get some great teachers go to a great school use some great books find out what it's really about you know so ian this sounds like a great time for you to ask your question i can tell you're ready yeah <laughs> yeah so that on that topic uh this is something we ask everybody. Um, so what's something that students should be thinking about that might not be on their radar? Like maybe a question that they should ask that they might not even think to ask. It seems sometimes that if it's not on their mind to ask it, they're not ready to hear the answer. But I do like that if you can just say, well, where are you now? How can I like point to me where you know, like show me? I can tell in three seconds when people play what the training they've had and what what training they haven't had. Even just how they hold the guitar, you can tell what they've had. But if they show me, I love this player, or I love this kind of writing, or this kind of expression. I want to be able to do that. You know, then you've got some place to go. It's like I want them to have an idea of where they could go. Help me. I want them to say like you know, help me be more of me. Help me. Uh, express what I'm trying to express. There's so many things for them to work on. That's great. Cheryl, what's on your mind? I just, I, I really love everything that you're saying and everything that you're doing, Lauren. I mean, I think, I mean, I, as I say, when I cross paths with your students, I was like, oh yeah, you really prepared. <laughs> and, and, I, and I know where you're coming from. I mean, I came up in that, very same I mean you know all that modern method stuff it's very it's very thorough you know mm. if you get through and oftentimes I say to folks like maybe some of it's a little outdated and some of it's dry as a bone because it is just like okay here are your scouts here's the stuff but yeah you know it gets the job done and then that building those skills just makes you ready for anything yeah well, I've always loved our conversations, even before you came, uh, became assistant chair. It's like anytime we talked about music, it was always so cool. Um, but, you know, it, it doesn't matter to me what books somebody uses. It's just that I haven't seen anything much better than the modern method. And it's got everything. So why not take the shortcut and go through the book and get it together, you know? But the only disappointment is if someone has been studying a long time and they haven't used any books, that's obvious too, you know? And so that's sad because if you have been playing that long, there's a lot of uh, progress that you could have made. Lauren, do you feel like um, being a teacher all this time parallel to your writing and recording and performance life, do you feel like the teaching part influences the artistic part? And, and if, if you do, could you put your finger on that? A little bit oh absolutely it's like a complete circle right i get inspired by my students they get inspired by me um they write something a certain way i write something you know we go back and forth it's just such a it's just wonderful to be around other musicians it's just 
you know, the, the best kind of company <laughs> for for me. Um, but the your teaching gets better. I remember thinking I have to learn how to explain things like 14 different ways, because it, when you're teaching a class, not everybody understands the words you're, you're choosing. And so that becomes very interesting, except when you talk to your regular friends, because if you say the same thing 14 different ways, they're like, yeah, you're a teacher. <laughs> you <know, like, laughs> keep repeating yourself. But uh, I just I just love it when someone's really hungry and they really want to learn. That's just the greatest combination because we inspire each other and it becomes this. This feeding <laughs> you know, that just goes around in a circle. It's a beautiful, beautiful cycle. You know, one of the themes at least, you know, especially in the beginning when we started doing these coffee hangs was adaptation because mm. we were going through this, the beginning of the pandemic. And now, you know, at the school, we're going through these different phases where, you know, we hope to be together, then we have to spend some time apart, then we have to. And I feel mm. like a lot of the faculty and who have gone through different times in their life, different phases, you know, one of the things that you're great at is you've been able to adapt in so many different situations, whether they're musical, professional, and everything. What what kind of advice do you have for your students these days when sometimes they have to like shift on a dime and, and just adapt and things change around them and it starts to freak them out a little bit? Like, what are some things that you think about in those situations? I used to, as a joke, sort of minimize some of their concerns by saying, look, in the balance of life and death, this doesn't even matter. You know, like you can get this together and it's going to be OK. But now you can't say that because we're, we're in this pandemic where it's like serious stuff, you know. But mostly it's a fear of learning. And I had it, too. I didn't even think I was somebody who was smart because school didn't bring that out of me. They didn't know how to find me or reach me. Like to me, the real education or the real exciting stuff was the guitar lessons outside of school, you know. So you've got to, I, I just try to get them to get over the fact that it's okay. And, you know, you can learn this. You learned how to tie your shoe. You learned how to stand up, you know, like everything is learned. Pretty much everything's only a few bodily functions that you're born with. Everything else is learned. So you can learn this if you have a desire to. And it's a teaching style and a learning style that, that it's a nice mesh when that when that works. And if not, just just find someone else who can explain it another way. You know, I, I like that show that you had done about reading. I uh, I always enjoyed teaching reading, but I disagreed when somebody would say just read something once or twice otherwise you're going to memorize it because the students hadn't learned any of the components yet you know it'd be like driving a car or playing a video game you know when I was a kid my younger sister 13 years younger than me was a little kid I go home after college she'd say hey you want to play this game with me she was like counting up all these points and getting all these things happening on the video game and she'd say here Laura you try and I go and it would just end you know and then she said okay back to me and like a half hour goes by and she's racking up all these points here you go Laura boom okay you're back to me and it was like I didn't know the game it was like who am I what color am I what am I supposed to eat what am I supposed to avoid what am I supposed to try to do like you have to know the rules so if you're reading something once or twice and you don't know where the notes are on the paper and you don't know where they are on the guitar or you know a couple, but you always pass over the triplets and you always pass over the sixteenths or anytime you see accidentals, you get lost. It's like you're never going to experience those. You've got to nail those down. And for me, learning the rhythms is like learning phonics. I always say, did you remember learning phonics? ER sounds like this. TH sounds like this. ING sounds like this. You can count on that. This is a triplet. It's kind of like ING, you know, <laughs> it's just like, you know, you've got to learn the junk and then use it. So make the distinction between I'm figuring out where I need to be, my highest note, my lowest note, my key signature, my time signature. Uh, I'm learning the rhythms. I'm conducting a few things, trying to get it in my head. OK, I'm understanding that. Now take it for a spin. Now practice keeping going. No matter what you do, put a you know parentheses maybe around two measures and say, I'm not going to stop no matter what. I'm going to keep it in time with the metronome. It's like 
practice the separating idea of I'm practicing something and fixing, going over it, going, you know, like the way we practice a, a piece and actually reading. And they get such a kick out of that. They're like, oh, you know, like I can read. And I really dislike when they come in and say, I suck at reading. It's like, when did you ever get any reading lessons? You know, somebody can come in here right now and say, oh, Passarelli, you think you're a great musician. Well, you're a terrible pilot. When did I ever take flying lessons? You know, it's like, you're not terrible at reading. You're just new at it. Give it a chance. It's easier than you think, you know? So funny. I really love that because that's so true. I've always thought that as well. Like when you just knew, like you wouldn't say to a six-year-old, a first grader, well, wow, you suck at math. It's like, well, yeah. you, you suck at walking, you little two-year-old. You're, you're no good at <laughs> physics. Like, I, well, I hope not, you know? I'm in the first grade, you know? I'm just a, I'm just a beginner, you know? Yeah. Um, but it is hard. I think it, sometimes it's hard. I love that you're equating being a beginner with this excitement and this curiosity. Because I think this is like so afraid to admit that they're a beginner because they think it makes them seem less than. So yeah. People won't want to hang out with me. They won't think I'm good enough. They won't, you know, but, you know, the truth is you, that's probably not true, first of all. And secondly, you just have to be where you are. And yeah. I think that's a great thing for them to see that you do, you know. Um, yeah. the, the other thing I was thinking about as you were talking about adapting was, you know, um, I think it's hard for some younger students to, to wrap their brain around this, but you were the first woman to be hired in the guitar department. Hmm, by and, Bill. Um, and right. And for quite some time, you know, like, a lot of us um, who are older than our current students were the first woman to X, Y, Z. Um, and it, that takes some adapting and it also takes a development, I think, of your sense of self when you're the only one of some someone or something. It wasn't, in a easy. Place. It, it right. wasn't easy, but what I had loved was I was playing nine years with a great teacher and great books and I knew I was good. I didn't care what any Berkeley teacher thought about me. I knew I had something going. I knew I could develop it. And I always tell my students, do not let Berkeley make music your enemy. Don't let it make guitar your enemy. You love this thing. Keep loving this thing, you know? Yeah, and you know what's interesting is it, it's not Berkeley that makes it your enemy. It's you. You make it your enemy. Absolutely. You let something make it your enemy because you're afraid exactly. to be a beginner. You're afraid to be... Um, I, I always have thought that, you know, when you are the first person to do something, you just make it like accessible for someone else to be the first person to do their thing. Um, mm. And I'm wondering like, but you know, when you are the first, it's like, you have to blaze that trail. It's not like someone can say, oh yeah, like I want to be like her. She's doing this thing I want to do. Mm. Um, regardless of whether or not that person is like you in that way, maybe they see that you well, you're the first person that I've seen do songwriting that way, or the first person to approach reading mm. music that way, or the first person, you know, to do something with production, or maybe they do see, wow, you know, there's a really badass guitar player as a woman. Mm. How did you, like, what are the things you think you learned from sometimes being the first at something? Well, I just knew it was possible because I was already doing it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You learn that uh, the first impressions uh, that people have sometimes of you are wrong. <laughs> you know, you prove them wrong kind of thing. Um, I, th I think it was really big of Larry, Larry Bayon. I was studying with him for many semesters and he said, I asked, I said to him, you know, I think I'd really like to teach here. Another teacher had put the idea in my head. And he said, I think you'd make a really good teacher. <laughs> and I never asked him what, what he thought, because I was just thinking, oh, okay, good. And he wrote me a letter and he had mentioned it to Bill and Bill was just like, yeah, this is great. He didn't know that, you know, he couldn't believe that I was playing Ricardo's with a pick, but, you know, Larry was like, oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> and Larry was so cool too, because I would be playing my pieces every week and then he'd say, what happened? You sounded much better last week and the week before that. Wait a minute. Let me see your pick. And he looks at the pick. He goes, you've worn out this pick. You're going to have to break in another pick before you've seen your recital. <laughs> like he had those detailed ears to know. I know you're practicing. I know it looks good, but something doesn't sound right. <laughs> it was so great. 
and and the honesty just to be able to say it like that right <laughs> yeah yeah that's but, great yeah. I, I was here, I was here at Berkeley, I think six or seven years before Robin was. And for a while it was just me and Robin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's but those were, you know, very different days. And, you know, just coming out of that, even as a student, it was like, Berkeley was a family owned business. It was like a vocational school. I think, I don't remember what year they became accredited. Does anybody know? But I came right after that. They hadn't been a major college yet, you know. And, um, you know, just like any other opinions or harassment or, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> men can do this, women can't kind of thing. It was, it was rampant. <laughs> you had to have a thick skin. Yeah. And, and you've seen a big change. Huge, huge. It's, it's amazing mm -hmm. how, uh, you know, uh, wonderful the environment has become and Kim, you've made this this giant change in just communication. I mean, the whole mm -hmm. atmosphere in the guitar department is completely different. You know, mm -hmm. because you talk, <laughs> you care, you you know, in 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 verbal ways. You know, you you let people know how you feel and what's going on, and it's just awesome. Cool. Um, I guess that leads to my kind of my last question before Cheryl and, and Ian ask their questions, but I want to know, like, from your perspective. What do you think, are there things you think we should be thinking about as we kind of look at the department from like the, you know, our perspective, what do you see that we should be seeing? Well, there's definitely a decline in understanding of reading and chords because we don't have those chord labs and reading labs. You know, everybody just wants to teach improv and nobody wants to do the nuts and bolts and everybody wants to improvise and nobody wants to play the field. It's like everybody wants to get up to bat and nobody wants to play rhythm. So it's, it's, uh, I would rather teach the complete instrument. It just does so many cool things. Let's go back to how many cool things it does. Make sure that someone can use a pick and can use their fingers and can play rhythm and can play lead and can improvise. There's so many things, but to focus just on improv, it's like how many people are making a living improvising? Maybe two at the time. There was, you know, Pat Metheny and Gary Burton. You know, everybody else was like, somebody's got to play the song so that you can improvise on it, you know? Yeah. We're working on that. We have our, our book that you contributed to uh, <laughs> the the, um, the intro and the sort of guide to the proficiency materials, all our nuts and bolts, I think is going to come out after the first of the year. So, oh, um, cool. so that'll be a really cool step in that direction. Um, um, because I agree, I think the complete instrument um, helps you be the complete musician. So <laughs> that's a great, great way of looking at it. Um, Cheryl, what about you? What's on your mind as we're kind of coming to the end of our coffee? Yeah, well, thanks for coming on and sharing all your wisdom and insights and um, jokes. Just that, you know, doesn't really matter the style, right? It's about playing the guitar and playing it beautifully and playing it with dynamics and all these things that we're talking about and developing those skills because that's going to open and unlock that door to whatever that is that you want to do, whether you're a songwriter mm -hmm. or you're uh, film scoring or you're going to want to be a side person or what, you know, whatever you still, it still comes down to the guitar. So thanks for reminding mm -hmm. us all the, to get in the practice, get in there and practice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about you, Ian? Yeah. And like, you know, just, piggybacking off of what Cheryl said, like articulation, you know, and like taking these these tools that we have and like the great materials that there is and really like charging it with music, you know, like all the different ways and the things that we've got at our disposal and like really using it, you know. Are you going to come up with a, a beatly kind of intro for this? <laughs> Little blue oh, that's blue. a challenge. That's a challenge. To get. <laughs> We're trying to get him to make a record of all of his coffee talk. Music. Oh, that would be great. Like it would be great. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Lauren, for hanging with us today. I think this is one that people are going to come back to. There's a lot of great things to think about. Um, so we really appreciate it. So thank well, you very much. Um, thanks to Cheryl Bailey, and uh, thank you, Ian Steed, and. Um, Thanks everybody for listening and we'll be with you on the next Coffee Talk. Woohoo!